I'm uh, Kimber McLeod from the Communication Studies Department. Uh, I've recently been involved in some copyright related altercations with my two year old son who, during our frequent dance parties, has accused me of uh, stealing his dance moves and <laughs> told him that because he did not affix his expression to a medium, he couldn't copyright it and therefore I could do with it whatever I wanted. He didn't like that answer. <laughs> um, I'm also going to follow up these preliminary comments with uh, uh, another kind of personal story that's a little more serious that involves a documentary that I made a couple years ago that broadcast on PBS, Copyright Criminals. And I'll use that as a way to, as a jumping off point uh, later on uh, to, to talk more expansively about how copyright impacts cultural production and creativity in many different areas of culture. So, uh, Copyright Criminals examined the, the messy three-way collision between digital technology, musical collage, and intellectual property. It aired on PBS, as I said, uh, a couple years ago, debuted at the Toronto International Film Festival, and uh, we were really excited about all these events because, well, it was professionally like quite fantastic to uh, hit those benchmarks. However, nevertheless, uh, despite our celebrating, we're actually kind of terrified. Uh, why? Well, we raised the money to license about two dozen songs and some footage uh, to, for use, for, so we could legally use it in our documentary. But nevertheless, our film contains over 400 brief but unlicensed uses of copyrighted material. When I can't sleep at night, I sometimes count how much we'd be liable for, up to $150,000 in statutory damages per infringement. That's 400 times 150,000 equals $60 million. Yes, $60 million. Okay. So why did we use so many clips? Why did we put ourselves in potential harm's way? My, doc my documentary partner, Ben, and I wanted the film's aesthetic to reflect its subject matter. Uh, collage, hip-hop sampling, and the rise of remix culture. Uh, Copyright Criminals documents how hip-hop producers have, since the genre's origins, cut and pasted portions of old records uh, within their own music. So, for years, hip-hop stayed beneath the commercial radar starting in the 1980s, uh, during its initial reign um, uh, as a recorded medium. Um, and because it was considered a fad, it gave producers a lot of creative freedom to make their art however they wished. Uh, so the music that emerged in the late 80s and early 1990s often featured very densely layered musical collages that were groundbreaking. Uh, groups like Public Enemy pushed the technological and creative boundaries to the limit, uh, creating elaborate collages that, uh, that might layer literally dozens of nearly unrecognizable oral quotations over the course of one song. Uh, and as we document in our film, the sample clearance system that emerged in the early 1990s uh, put the brakes on this kind of innovative music making. Uh, Chuck D, the group's leader, Public Enemies group leader, once told me that uh, one of their songs that contained 20 short samples uh, would cost more or less 40 times what it would take for, say, Puff Daddy to sample a single chorus of someone else's song. Why? Well, the music industry believed that, uh, the, music, the music industry believed that the law didn't distinguish between the copying of one second or half a minute of an entire sound recording. Therefore, the record companies now insist that uh, every single fragment of sound needs to be cleared, uh, something that fundamentally altered the oral evolution of hip-hop music. Uh, the more, in other words, the more complex you make your sound collage, the more impossible it is to share it with the world legally. Uh, and in, in the course of documenting the legal and cultural history of this art form in our documentary Copyright Criminals, Ben and I are risking being sued. One of the more headache-inducing aspects of the way that copyright is interpreted is how, hap ha how haphazardly uh, it's applied in different contexts. So when writing a book, quoting from another book is perfectly acceptable, generally. Uh, but quoting uh, more than two lines uh, from a song lyric, even if it takes up less than 0.0001% of the book's total text, that might give your publisher a problem. Uh, if your band perfectly imitates the distinctive drum, drum pattern from a Bo Diddley record, no problem, no worries. Uh, musicians have been doing that for half a century. Uh, but when you sample Bo Diddley's beats um, directly from a sound recording, that could be a copyright infringement if you don't get asked for permission. Inversely, you don't need to ask for permission when you cover, say, a Beatles song um, or any other song, as long as you play the, as long as you pay the per song 
a statutory fee that's set by Congress, and as long as you don't alter the lyrics. So, in other words, it gets really, really confusing what copyright law does, as well as the way it gets interpreted by music industries and other creative industries. So, when sampling, just to give you some more copyright basics, uh, when, when sampling, one has to deal with two types of copyright holders. The song publishing company that controls the composition, in other words, the lyrics and the melody, and the record company that owns the sound recording, in other words, the recorded performance of the musical composition. Uh, and this, isn't, isn't, this is not just true for hip-hop artists, but also a documentary, uh, a documentary film makers like me who would like to use a song in our film. So uh, each copyright, the sound recording copyright and the publishing copyright, can be expensive to clear, and the costs multiply exponentially if a song contains several samples, like a public enemy song. So you sometimes end up paying 200% or 500% or even 2,000% of what it costs to simply cover a Beatles song um, than when you, uh, well, try and sample it. Sure, original creators should most definitely share the profits when it's appropriate, but each share, in my opinion, ought to be a fraction of what that new work generates. In other words, uh, you know, uh, the, the pie should be just split up into like 100 different pieces and allocated appropriately, rather than having to buy 20 different pies. Northwestern law professor Peter DeCole and I demonstrated this problem in our book, A Creative License, which came out a year ago. Uh, we asked and analyzed what it would cost at today's rates to clear the audio fragments that make up Public Enemy's classic 1990 album, Fear of a Black Planet. We crunched the numbers, and in our conservative, very conservative estimate, the group would lose roughly $5 per album sold. That's a loss of $5 million on a platinum record. Our documentary isn't as good as a classic public enemy record, but it shares a key characteristic. It's made up from the fragments of a few hundred copyrighted sources. If Ben and I tried to clear everything in the film, copyright criminals would have been prohibitively expensive to make. In other words, we made a film that tries to educate people about the ill effects of the copyright clearance system but that very same system muzzled our ability to show how crazy this state of affairs really is. Somewhere, Kafka's having a laugh attack. When we started making copyright criminals in 2003, I approached music industry uh, clearance professionals about working on our project. And uh, when I talked to one particular person and told her that it was a documentary about the history of sampling, she just said flat out, you'll never be able to make that film legally. And she explained in great detail how hard it is to license sample-based songs for a film because they contain so many different copyrights attached to so many different copyright owners. And in fact, she used Public Enemy as an example of what can go wrong when you uh, get multiple copyright holders involved. The clearance costs multiply, but so can the refusals. That's one of the problems. Uh, so in our case, when we tried to license a classic sample-based song um, for one of our films, we weren't able to do so, even though we had a reasonable budget uh, to uh, pay out owners. One of the, uh, so in this particular case, one of the song's corporate co-owners refused us, and even though the rights holders were willing to take the money, um, uh, even though the other rights holders, because multiple rights holders were attached to that particular song, even though they wanted to take the money, that single veto torpedoed the deal. Uh, and when we contacted the artist who wrote and recorded the track, and actually, I think, uh, say it was Chuck D from Public Enemy, he tried to intervene on our behalf, um, but even though he wrote and recorded the song, he was not able to prevail either. Another denial came from an infamous company named Bridgeport. So due to some shady but t sadly typical music biz shenanigans, this entity owns many of the rights to George Clinton's funk oeuvre, uh, specifically records uh, by his hugely popular band, Parliament Funkadelic, uh, uh, which was, whose catalog is hev has been heavily sampled. Thousands and thousands of samples appear in various recordings in the past 20 years. So the day after the court affirmed that Bridgeport controlled the copyrights to George Clinton's song, it filed suits against the recorded 800 parties for unauthorized sampling. And in a, uh, and in a page ripped straight out of Evil Corporation Digest, one of those sl slapped with the copyright infringement suit was George Clinton for sampling himself. <laughs> yeah, I got sued for sampling my own stuff, Clinton told me with a bemused smile. In fact, I still got a suit pin. 
Uh, so after trying for six weeks to license one of George Clinton's songs, uh, one of the songs that Bridgeport owned, uh, the company representative finally got back to us. The man on the other end of the line, who I imagine was chomping on a cigar, said, only, denied! Before abruptly hanging up, he added, denied, no reason! <laughs> um, and then email uh, Bridgeport followed up and reminded us that they could sue us if we went ahead and tried to use uh, that composition. Uh, Okay, and fun fact, also, if they end up suing us, uh, the case would be called, be called Bridgeport versus Copyright Criminals, which would be kind of funny for everyone except for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's something fundamentally wrong when a professor who studies copyright has problems making and distributing a film because the film's subject matter stands in the way. But after all, a lot of hard work, our film made it into the world. So how did we pull it off? Two words, fair use. Uh, as Nick said, the U.S. statute allows you to quote from copyrighted works without permission for the purposes of education, commentary, criticism, and other transformative uses. Uh, and in 2005, the Washington, D.C.-based Center for Social Media worked with documentarians to develop and publish an influential document that helped strengthen fair use. It was titled, The Documentary Filmmaker's Statement of Best Practices in Fair Use. And it provided uh, clear guidelines for quoting copyrighted content in ways that documentarians considered fair. So given that courts pay attention to how a particular community's standard, uh, because courts pay attention to a particular community's standards when deciding copyright infringement cases, this was a key factor in successfully persuading broadcasters like PBS, uh, DVD distribution companies, and insurers to relax their stringent rights clearance policies. This made it possible for copyright criminals to air on television. And in fact, uh, Fair use may very well apply to the many, kind, the, the many examples of transformative sampling in hip hop that was documented in copyright criminals. Uh, even, you know, several documentary, uh, sorry, several music industry attorneys have privately admitted this to me. So, one of the major ir ironies of her film is that if fair use had been more firmly established for sampling 20 years ago, things might have turned out very differently for Public Enemy and others. Uh, obviously, not everything is fair use, and when we make copyright criminals, we are very judi judicious in our decisions about what counted as fair use and what didn't. Uh, also, there are other downsides to relying on fair use. Uh, fair use is merely a defense that you can invoke after being sued. It's not something that you can just simply assert, like a force field that protects you uh, from lawsuits. Um, and, and also, you know, intellectual property cases can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to litigate. But nevertheless, fair use opened doors for us that would have been otherwise slammed shut, so I'm not complaining by any stretch. Ben and I eventually cleared the hurdles that stood in our way. But what about the other creators out there who don't have the access to the same sorts of resources that I, a university professor, and someone who is well-versed in copyright law, have? Wouldn't it make more sense to pay a reasonable and predictable fee uh, based on how much a new work, uh, uh, based on how much, like, profits or, or net, uh, uh, or, or even gross that a new work makes. So one imperfect but useful model is ASCAP, whose blanket license makes it possible for radio stations, bars, and live music venues to, uh, to perform and broadcast music. So in other words, instead of tracking down each and every song publisher and negotiating fees before a song is played in a bar or over the radio, uh, all they have to do is merely pay an annual lump sum. The blanket license is the reason why audio mashup artists can play their sound collages in clubs, uh, which is another kind of weird inconsistency with the way copyright law is enforced, because if they put out those very same, if they fixed those performances onto a medium like a CD, uh, they would be liable for copyright infringement. So, uh, to wrap up, a streamlined licensing structure complemented with strong fair use protections would go a long way in, uh, towards fixing this broken licensing system. Um, and, uh, and, and in closing, I just wanted to note that there's been a lot of talk about like, the democratic potential that new media technologies, uh, digital technologies, um, have created. But the, the sad fact is that uh, copyright laws, the sorts of situation, and, and the way that they're interpreted within industries uh, in the ways that I've discussed just now, um, close off that democratic potential. Uh, okay, I'm going to hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you.